on pressure. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Initially, at, and at the very beginning, uh, it didn't move at all, right? Physically, it didn't move. So the stick, I have a little one here, you know, it, not, the, not the same one, but it wouldn't move, but you'd have to push 35 pounds of pressure to, to turn it. Uh, and they, wow. the test pilot said it was way too weird, actually, that it doesn't move. Um, so they actually make it move, but it's just to make the humans happy. <laughs> placebo. You know, like, it, it doesn't need it. Yeah, yeah placebo to give you the, the feeling. It's kind of hard to move. Uh, you got to... I don't know. I guess maybe I should have worked out more. But if I'm turning to the to the right, I would push with my other hand actually to cheat. You know, um, yeah. That's anyway. a fascinating aircraft. That's what two sidewinders on the wingtips, and then it's got some some capability for like 500 pounders, right? If I'm not mistaken, some bombs if you need to. And what is that? A 20 mic mic cannon on it, or what? What is it? Yeah, that's the normal the Vulcan 20 millimeter they put like on every other. You know, it's like the it's like the 1911 of um cannon you know air cannon they can't make anything better than it so that's that's you know the the iron dome systems that defend the the bases yeah. and such it's the same same gun yeah so it's yeah. It, that's incredible what what an incredible aircraft that is by the way guys this is going to continue happening my wife got mad at me because i i'm using headphones and she says you can't i can't wear headphones anymore because it, it looks terrible so i'm trying these little earbuds the problem is as most people know, I got a big fat head and these, these little earbuds I put in are never big enough. So they constantly fall out. I promise you, it's not a tactic to try to change a question. If you ask me a question, it's just, they just, they won't stay in. I need a, like a rubber band or something or glue. Hey guys, I accidentally went live. So <laughs> that's okay. I don't care. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> that, whatever. Man. Let's I, go. I was hearing that great content about the F-16 and I didn't want to, I didn't want anybody else to miss yeah. it, but I should have. It's, it's a fabulous bird. It really is. It's, it's, you know, as far as an interceptor, um, I mean, there it's, it's a legendary aircraft, you know, again, Chris can tell you a lot more about it than I can. I, I was on the more the tech protect side of the house. So our job was to try to protect military technologies and avionics and, and whatnot. Uh, but as far as, as, as an aircraft is concerned, it's still one of the most highly maneuverable manned aircraft that we have in our inventory. I mean, it is just an amazing, amazing aircraft. Yeah, I think they really just got it uh, nailed down, you know, after 40, 43 years. It, yeah, same age as me, actually. We were born the same year. Uh, 78 is when, uh, when the Viper came out. Yeah, they're still yeah. flying. They keep mounting. They changed the mission. Like you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, it was like your, your uh, point defense fighter, right? So the Russians had over the over the pole nuclear capability and so the viper was basically a little motorcycle you keep i don't know in your garage down down i don't know on the points of america and then just roll out and take off on a highway right with that 20 millimeter right. cannon and the sidewinder is exactly what you talked about yeah that's that's what it's designed for it looks so smooth it's so small the rcs you know you look yeah. at it, it's so hard to pick up visually um but but now it's a different war you know now they they mount all these systems on it the aft pod right that's a bit you know, it's like I think it's 550 pounds for one of those one of those pods. Um, wow! And it, or it, actually, heavier. Sorry. And they just mount that right on on the front of it. So now it's not quite as maneuverable. You know, they mount everything on. And Chris, it. I don't think people realize. Alexi can probably add to this too. You know, every pound on an aircraft not only does it mean something, and it takes away from your ability to do other things and, and lowers your range and your speed, but in reality, you have inertial issues as well, right? So you can imagine. I tell people, look, you can hold a dumbbell, hold a 20 pound dumbbell close to you like this, and you can run and you can maneuver. Now take two dumbbells and hold them way out here and try to be as nimble and maneuver. It's, it's a lot harder because now you, you, know, you have centri centrifugal forces playing on these things. So every pound you put on an aircraft, when you, when you pull and let's say do a, a, a 9G turn, well, now that 500 pound you know, at FLIR pod is nine times the weight. Right. And so now you're putting those stresses on that small, tiny airframe in that aircraft, you know, and expecting that aircraft to still perform like it did, you know, with without it. And I, I, I I'm not sure people really appreciate that. I mean, that's that's physics. And when it comes to this topic of, of UAPs and particularly one of the observables, which was instantaneous acceleration from a physics perspective, that's really hard to do. Now, I'm not a, a physicist. I do have some background in science, but a lot of our our, our scientists in ATIP at the time were looking at that. How can you have an aircraft that's not doing, I mean, an air, for example, you know, nine G's is, is a lot to consider. Well, we're, we're picking things up doing six, seven, 800 G forces where the inertial forces are on that would be acting upon that vehicle 
are, are, are something that, I mean, just even from a material science perspective, it's just hard to wrap your hands around the type of stresses that would be, that would be encountered on an airframe. Chris, if you don't mind, you guys wore G suits, right? On, on those aircraft. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and when I was, you know, growing up in the, in the airframe, it was just chaps, right? The G suits we had didn't actually cover your ass, right? They don't cover your largest muscle. And that's the biggest problem, right? Is, is your blood flow going down? Um, so you mentioned nine G's, you know, the Viper was, is known as the, you know, probably the highest G aircraft that we had and still probably, um, maybe the F-22. Uh, but yeah, we lost a lot of guys, right? They, they, if you G lock, right. If you have too many G's and you don't maintain the blood pressure using that anti G strain maneuver, uh, you know, the blood removes out of here first, which is your visual, actually your visual sight goes first, right? So out of your blood, uh, and then you G lock and guys were, were, were dying essentially. And then, uh, they added this advanced new G suit, right? It's, it's the, the new advanced G suit for the F 22. That's the only reason it came out because for the F 22 and their new advance, right. Is they just sewed in around the ass. That's it. <laughs> I swear to God, like they just made pants instead of uh, chaps. And everybody complained. We're all like pants, you know, like no real fighter pilots wear chaps, you know, and you can right. you can unzip them easily and, and walk back with the, the jet, you know, looking cool or whatever. Uh, but now, no, people don't die as much. You know, it's um, yeah. there's like there's simple changes in them. Um, they knew about the technology before and it still took like 15 years to get it instituted. Uh, that safety mechanism. It took 15 years to get instituted, I think, in, in the Viper. So we're just like, guys, just dying, planes crashing. Um, you know, I was in the safety field. It was very frustrating as well. And I, I, I'll so, just mention it now since, since I, you know, you're famous, more people watch this, is drogue shoots. <laughs> we need drogue shoots on our F-35s, and, the, and it, would save, it would save pilot lives and us millions and millions of dollars, probably billions. Um, I love I that idea. And, and that more in. importantly, it's it's it would save lives. I, I agree. Why don't you yeah. very quickly explain, because I want to ask you some questions about that, but explain what a drogue shoot is for, for the audience so they know what that is. A uh, drogue shoot. So we have it. It's it's a little parachute that pops out of the back. Um, and and basically, you can do it on landing. So F4s used to have them, right? If, you're, if your aircraft, uh, if it has a really long roll distance, it's very dangerous, right? Takeoff and landing is the most performing part of an aircraft, as you know, Lou, right? As you're taking off, you're the heaviest. Um, so this drogue chute will actually stop uh, the aircraft sooner, right? But now you got to pick it up. It adds more weight. Like you mentioned, that trade-off, everything in everything in aviation is a trade-off. And for this, you would have to trade off some sort of uh, weapon system, right? In the military, they always want more weapons. You know, if, if we can put more weapon capability on it, they will go for it. If you put more right. safety on it, or, or something like that, they're like, eh, you know, <laughs> does right. it, is it going to help yeah. us? Hey, this combat? is war. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you exactly. know, I remember the Starfighter being one of the first aircraft that I remember seeing the drogue shoot because it's that Starfighter was a, an old aircraft, but extremely fast for its time. And it had these little tiny stubby wings. And so when it came in, it'd come in really hot. And so they would use the, the, that. And I think even the F-111 may have had a, had a drogue shoot as well uh, on some of their uh, electronic versions of what I think the, the, if I'm not mistaken, they had the wild weasel missions in Vietnam and they'd load the crap out of those aircraft with electronics. So let me ask you this. So you wear a G suit and as we know to stop, you know, certain things from happening, uh, negative biological consequences, such as blackouts and red outs, which frankly, as you said, can kill you. Um, and the human being can withstand about nine G forces for a short period of time, whereas an F-16 can withstand a little bit twice that before you start having structural issues with, with the aircraft and the airframe. Alex, uh, if I may, Alexei, let me ask you this. Um, you know, if we know that some of our best aircraft can handle, you know, up to let's let's just say for argument's sake, a round number of like around 20 G's, which is a tremendous, I mean, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of stress. What would it take then for the objects that we're seeing sometimes as it relates to UAPs, something that's doing three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred G forces? Um are you i mean what from as a scientific person from a physics perspective what 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 are your thoughts on that what 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 could that possibly how is that possible it has to do with our understanding of the manifestation of matter within our perception um when it comes to momentum and gravity i don't think our current models of physics even get cl come close to explaining them and so the way that i see it is that our current now meaning our current frame of motion that we experience is being manifested from the past and from the future. So in order to move um, an object 
at those kind of types of velocities, you need to you need to move the past of the object, and you also need to move the future of the object at the same time. That's really fascinating. You know, there's we tend to look at um, certainly in in military perspectives, and of course the classic you know science way the way that I was I was I learned in school. You learn about Newtonian physics, right? And so any any object in in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Force equals mass times acceleration and things like that. Um, I find it really fascinating that you're talking about about an object in space time where both its past and its future in space time uh, has something to do with with the maneuverability. Um, yes. You know, that's something that our scientists did look at and are looking at. Um, it's 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 certainly very perplexing because our current standard models of physics just just don't allow us to really wrap our 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 heads around what we're observing um you know anything that we would have had certainly biologically uh, would have been turned into into pudding right inside yeah. inside of something like that um i mean you can look at a at a, at a for example a, a dragster going down down the road and it does a quarter mile now in in a high three seconds and that that alone, which is some G force, is certainly not four or five, six hundred G forces, is literally detaching the retina from from some of the driver's eyes. They're getting yeah. corneal bleeds and they're getting, you know, concussions by basically damage that you would see consistent with some sort of type of head trauma yeah. because of those accelerating forces. Um, you know, do you, can you expand a little bit more about that about theory about about yeah. past and present? I find that fascinating. Yeah, so basically, if you wanted to consider modern rocket technology, fuel systems, and things like, like that, they use jet propulsion, which is basically uh, the conservation of momentum. So if you know, if I throw a ball in this direction, um, one half mv squared, one half mv squared, or mv mv, whatever you want to say it, um, I throw a ball, I get a reaction in that direction. But that's only working with our now state of perception. That's only working with our now moment. It doesn't include the energy that's coming into that's creating the object or the energy that's being released from the object as it's manifesting within our perception. Um, and so in order to have that you know, type of instantaneous acceleration, you need to move the past and the future at the same time, which, which so I like that, to call the node of manifesting matter. So uh, Alexei, that's, that's fascinating. So let's take this cell phone for a sec example. Yeah. And in order for me to throw this cell phone across the room, I have to put energy into it for it to do it. But you're also saying that the phone inherently itself has energy also yes. in it, and also you're saying there's also energy as well uh, as a result of it, whether it's creating friction as it's going through the air or whatever. So it's not just energy required to throw the phone, but there is other energy around involving the phone itself um, that maybe we, you know, it doesn't seem obvious. Let's say to 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 most folks when we're talking about. You know, physics, really. Um, right. I had a colleague of mine, a really, really good friend of mine, he still is, is Dr. Hal Pudoff. And, and he and another guy, Eric Davis, and some other scientists did a lot of work for us on zero point energy. Can you can you explain, because I'm certainly not a physicist, can you explain no. kind of in your own words, what is zero point energy or vacuum energy? It's the energy of creation um, is the easiest way for me to put it. Um Think of it as the ether, maybe, is a good way to put it. And our entire four, from my understanding, our entire four-dimensional perception of reality is being manifested from a fifth dimension, which, which essentially is an energetic vortex. Um, and so that energy that we experience has to do with our frame of motion. And so if you were to essentially tunnel into denser realms of experience, that's where higher and higher energies exist. And when you say, when you say, like, if you can, in, in lay terms, because, you know, my, fortunately, my, I come from my, my daughters are very smart. And my wife, my, my daughters get their intellect from, from my wife. Thank God. I'm not as smart. Can you, can you kind of distill that down kind of a lay, lay terms of, of when you say higher energies and whatnot, right. what, what does that mean? And if I were to, you know, look at this and you're, you're going to explain it to, to, a, let's say a four-year-old like me. Um, well, me, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> energy is related to frequency and also velocity, um, you could say. So if the faster something goes, the more energy it has. 
And also the higher the frequency something is, the more energy it contains. And so when you think about a vortex and any orbits of any system, if you're further away, you need to go faster. But when it comes to creating a frequency within our experience, the closer you are to center is the higher the frequency. So if you think that we live in a black hole, or if that's a perception of some people are making, um, then the closer you are to center would be the higher frequencies, which ultimately are higher energies. That's, can I, can I uh, in that's, or, that's uh, please, because that's well above um, my pay grade, that's for sure. <laughs> I, well, I've been just working with Alexei, and I, I don't know, I have a kind of a separate theory, which um, I think it, it, it does relate. Uh, I think my theory is more observational on what we see of the physical universe. And Alexei's is more on how it actually would, would work or how uh, the, the engine behind it, I guess, if you will. Um, and really, my theory is just based on size because you're talking about that. So the, if you imagine, um, you know, think of nuclear reactions, uh, there's intense, intense power at the very small levels, obviously. Right. And so we were able to tap into that with, uh, you know, after Einstein uh, and World War II. Right. And immediately we, we use it for weapons. You know, so, I mean, I, I don't I don't fault any extraterrestrial life if they are here and happen to give us technology uh, for not giving us any matter propulsion, you know, which would destroy half the earth if you, you know, or could. That's well, it's kind of like good. giving a, a, a loaded shotgun to, to a gorilla, right? I mean, um, probably not a very wise <laughs> idea, especially when that gorilla doesn't know how to use it and has a kind of a history of being kind of violent towards his, Definitely. Uh, you know, that's a good way of thinking friends. of it too, because when we use fuel, right, as far as molecule size and reactions, fuel is a bigger molecule as opposed to when you're splitting apart an atom. And so now when you're tunneling into zero point, you're going, you're getting even smaller than the atom. And so that's why they say infinite energy, right? Is zero point. So I guess uh, just to, yeah. so how it would relate is that the, the smaller dimensions um, would be, uh, I guess, higher frequencies. Basically, does that, does that make sense, uh, Alexei? Would you yes. concur with that? I, that? That goes along the same lines of thinking. Yeah, totally. And then as the outer dimensions would be to the, the galaxy, the the um, the supercluster, you know, the local regions, however you go out in that, we still have very much to learn about the outer, outer spaces. But if you look down now, you can look down in dimensional levels. Uh, if you look through the physical world, um, then you're looking through size. And that's why I think your atoms... Um, is what we see at a lower dimensional level. Um, so, and that relates to, I think, Alexei's argument on the denser regions, I think could be coming from the smaller <laughs> points of, you know, yes. uh, where if you imagine how many trillions and trillions of, um, you know, even just cells are in your, uh, I think we have up to a, a trillion cells in your body, right? Is that what we're up to now? If you imagine how many atoms are in there, your, your opportunity for, I don't know. Anyway, some dimensional relationship. Uh, and then the, the outer dimensions would be based size and density. Um, so I'll just finish with kind of how I understand Alexei. I've been still studying it, right? I read his book and, and study it. Um, yeah, seriously. <laughs> and uh, but uh, so basically is, is what like it you. is, is uh, we're yeah. orbiting around <laughs> around time. If you can think of uh, our frequency uh, is a circle that's going around time um, and we're when when man, when we see matter, it's because we're going the same speed around it. It's coming into phase essentially, yep. um, and then that's basically as, as far as I've gotten essentially. Well, that also helps. question for Alexei: <clears throat> How does your your um, theory on you know the creation of matter correlate with like the textbook version of say dark energy, you know, which we think now is what seventy percent of the universe or whatever. Uh, I don't think you know that's I mean, nice how, how do you how do you kind of correlate how do you kind of tag this thing with that thing that you know what I mean? Well, it's hard, it's hard to describe something we have no real physical evidence of to begin with. And when it comes to dark matter, and this is something that Chris Leto always talks about too, um, is the scales of size of organisms. Um, and I almost see dark matter as you could say the cardiothoracic system of reality. Um, meaning like the, the blood and veins of reality. And it, and from our perception, it appears that matter forms around dark matter. So dark matter can be considered like tunnels almost within the fluid of experience. Um, that's just how I like to think of it. I'm always trying what? to find a way to connect Alexei's uh, content with like textbook 
because it's different. It's so there's, you know, there's. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Alexei, let me ask you, if I may, because this is one of the, the you know, we now see scientists and, and physicists such as yourself and, and, and astrophysicists and Avi Loeb and some other individuals. There's actually some academic institutions now that are actually starting a curriculum on this. How do we break down the barrier for the academic and scientific communities to look at a topic that has been historically so associated with, with stigma, taboo, pseudoscience? Yeah. And 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 look at something, um, you know, fair minded, objective and logically, um, because there look, let's let's face it. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of baggage associated with this topic. Uh, you know, ask, ask me how I know. Right. As a, as a former intelligence officer, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not a UFO guy. It just so happens that was my job for a while. Um, how do we and the you know, the intelligence community is one thing that's already a tough nut to crack. But but the academic community, that's that's a whole nother mountain. That's that's almost in some cases harder to crack. How how would what would be your word of advice to your colleagues to I, to look at this I, topic? I've been doing my best to crack that code. You could say what you just mentioned, how, the way to introduce new ways of thinking. And um, what I do is I, I go over just the analysis of the human body because okay, so science is based off you could say evolution, um, and then we have the physical reality. Okay, so let's scale up evolution from a single cell. We start off, we have feel, no feel. We have heat, no heat. Okay, so what's our range of vision? What's our perception at that point in reality? What would we think reality would even look like at that point? So now, okay, let's just say we gain ears. Now our entire world and space of understanding is based off sound. Okay, cool, that's great. So sound is the maximum speed of, of sound. There's sound holes, right? That would be like a thing that comes into, into physics if that's all we had. But we, now hey, we, gain, we have eyes, guys, so we can see. So now we think we see to the edge of the universe and we think we see all of time, but in reality, we're a single cell becoming more evolved. And as we gain senses, we gain awareness. And so to say that the speed of light is a barrier, I call an illusion. Um, it's the universe's greatest magic trick that comes from evolving within an expanding universe. I've actually had hope in this That's subject uh, after seeing Eric Weinstein join the Galileo project. I mean, it seems like more and more people are opening up to being more public about it. I so, don't know. That's yeah, that's the first thing I do in, in the book that I wrote. I, I go step by step, human senses, and then I go into the Doppler shift. And then I go into, um, you know, we think the source of light is the source of information exchange and it moves forward from there. And then I talk about gravity and different things like that. Yeah, that's, that, uh, let me ask you this, Alexei. What, you know, again, and this is not a trick question, but, but <laughs> I struggle with this myself because. One of, again, one of the observables, and I hate to use this term because I know it's, it's, it's a bad term and the vernacular is anti-gravity. But in reality, we're talking about something having the ability to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity that are beyond the fundamentals of flight, right? So you have thrust, lift, drag, and weight, and you understand those and you can create a lifting body with thrust and you can now fly. Um, you can also defy Earth's gravity through buoyancy or lighter than air, right? Helium or, or a hot air balloon. And you can also do it through sheer ballistics, right? Again, yeah. force equals mass times acceleration. Blow something out of a tube with enough power and it's going to go up for a while uh, yeah. until it comes down, unless you, you reach escape velocity. So um, how, what is, before? I think before we can explain, even try to ask a question, how is this possible? Let me ask you, um, from your perspective, Alexei, what is is gravity what is it actually i know we, we we can look we can drop a pen and say that's gravity well no actually that's an effect of gravity but but what is gravity some have speculated it's it's a particle like a, like a graviton where others have say no it's a wave where others say no it's more of a field and it's an effect of 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 mass perturbing space time what is from your perspective what is gravity a result of space preparation and the synchroniz the synchronization of light being manifested from that fifth dimensional vortex. A synchronization of energy. Um, a good way to think of it is tidal locking. Um, just energy naturally synchronizes. And so what most people are, are familiar with is gravity of the body. So that's why I'm pulled to the earth. I'm synchronized to the earth. But yet I also have the potentiality of motion to do and choose and to do anything I want. And so when you think about motion in general with momentum and you think about locations, it has to do with the overlapping of all energies in reality, the synchronization of all energy in reality. 
And so when it comes to gravity of the body, that comes to synchronizing with the galaxy, the sun, and the earth. But when it comes to our motions on our earth, that has to do with synchronizing with the wants, don't wants, assumptions, and expectations that have been instilled throughout your lifetime. Um, so it's, it's a node of manifestation created by synchronization of incoming energy. So is it, is it fair to say that gravity is something that is, is, it's, it's poorly understood and poorly explained simply because the, the, the existing notions of gravity haven't been, haven't been, uh, trying to figure out the, the right way to say this because it's it's it, it it's constantly pestering me as well and i'm always asking physicists okay yeah. what is it you know what is it and a lot of times they say what you say well it's not it's not a thing it's yeah. it's a relationship it's yeah, a exactly. it's a it's a relationship between two things that those that and there is some sort of of, of synchronization going on whatever that synchronization yeah. is you know that we, it's very poorly understood so if someone wanted to, let's say, create something here on Earth, hypothetically, and again, this is not a trick question, I'm not going to hold you to it because I, I, we, we really don't know. How would one, if someone wanted to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity, um, what are some of the ways someone might might do that? Uh, I know people talk about what the uh, Kasmiri effect or something to that effect. Uh, that's one of them. And there's some other uh, electrogravitics. But can you can you kind of go through the maybe what some of the options might be, hype, uh, theoretically? It won't. Let's say this could be a good time to mention our project. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, magic squares. Uh, yeah, just go I mean, through, I've been uh, on, Yeah, I've been working on my theory for a very long time, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, and I uh, haven't had any backing really uh, from the scientific community. And um, or, honestly, if Artisan Tony didn't see some random video I made for you specifically, um, I wouldn't be out here talking. I wouldn't have finished writing my series of books. I probably would have just kept sitting in my room. Um, and so what Chris Leto is kind of like hinting towards is, um, we've been working on some, some designs and some drawings that I feel like answer some of these bigger questions. And so in the future, we, we, we note that you, uh, joined the Galileo project. If you could help us as well in the future, we appreciate that. Um, but, <laughs> but to go off, I mean, of yeah, the, I mean, the scientific community is, is starving for, for, you know, new, new ideas. Right. Um, and I can tell you that from, from firsthand accounts, talking to members of the scientific community. So, uh, I, I'd really be, and I know probably your audience, and I know, you know, Tony as well would be all interested to hear, hear kind of whatever you're willing to share. I, I'd certainly yeah. be interested to hear it. Well, and that's where it's gravity to defy earth's gravity is to defy your natural creation almost. Um, and so that has to do with just the natural vortex. And it does go back to the gyroscopic precession of gyroscopes, right? Why do you even gyroscopes even precess to begin with? And it, it has to do with the synchronizing of your light with the incoming and outgoing universe. And so. Yeah, well, I would say the first is uh, the interdimensional telescope. I mean, that's probably the most interesting. Um, yeah. but just a quick thing is. Um, Lou, what we're doing is uh, we're using uh, my brand, Lado Files, and we're going to uh, publish an NFT collection. It's crypto, uh, 10,000, and then we're going to use half the funds to search for evidence of UAPs, right? It's like a grassroots uh, Galileo project, uh, and hopefully fund Sky360. Um, oh, that's fascinating. First, yeah, sorry. And Go ahead. So that really leads into the question almost, though, like how far away are the stars? Um, when we consider our perception of now as being manifested from a fifth dimensional vortex, how, how far away are we really from the stars? We look up, they look really far away. We look at the ground, it looks really close. Like, what is the actual distance when it comes to the dimension of density? Right. Well, you know, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I, I've often told people, look, let's just do a, a quick a hypothetical exercise just for a quick second here. And let's just say that all of a sudden, you pop into existence, Alexei, just, just, you know, there's nothing. And all of a sudden, in order for matter to exist, you must have a space for matter to exist, reside in. And so all of a sudden you would now exist. You look around, there's nothing around you. So you have no idea in relationship to anything, how big you are, how small you are, even if you're moving or not, because there's nothing to relate to. Now, all of a sudden, Chris pops into, into existence. And now there's you and Chris in the, in the universe. That's all that exists. So you look at each other and you say, okay, well, you know, I, I don't know how far you are away. You seem 
here, but really you could be, I could be really huge and you could be light years away, or we could be really, really small right next to each other. I like There's that. still no way to know, right? That's and cool. I not like that. Yeah. So then you get a bunch of other points and then you start looking at each other and say, okay, well, there's something to relate to. Okay. You're over there. I'm over here. You're actually moving away from me. So there's a sense of, of motion and speed to, you know, to some degree, but it's relative because at the end of the day, all the matter in the universe, you can still look up and say, wow, the universe is really big and atoms are really small. But in reality, that's just in perspective to us. That's just, in yes. we don't know how big or how small the universe really is. So is there a flat, to, right? To, to, to a superverse. Uh, no, I'm joking when I say that. No, so like, is there a flat, right? Like um, that used to be our perspective. From Earth, we look up, the sun goes around the Earth. Sun goes around Earth from Earth. That's a common, like if I were a human on Earth, I look at the sun, the sun goes around it. That's our yeah, perspective. Yeah. That's right. We felt that way for, for a long, long time. And it wasn't until we stepped outside of Earth to realize that's not the way it works. And Exactly. And uh, so now when we look at the edge of the universe, hey, universe expands from every point in space and time. Universe must be expanding. Um, is that but, really the case? Right. Or let, let's break it down. Or let's break it down to the most primitive experience. We have a consciousness and we have a field of energy. That is the most primitive you can be. Consciousness, field of energy. And what we what we see from our days is that things are orbiting. We orbit the center of the earth. Earth orbits the center of the galaxy. At that point, we think universe is expanding. Well, hey, there's time dilations and Lorentz contractions associated to motion. And when we're talking about the orbit around the center of the galaxy, we're already going what, 30,000? I don't know the actual number off the top of my head, but we're already going. 24,000 like miles an hour. We're, we're, our rotational speed at the equator is about roughly 24,000 miles an hour. And then, of course, you have you have the orbital speed around the sun, which is, is considerably greater. And But yeah, I've got you. And, then, and that, then you get the orbit the around the galaxy, right? And then so how fast is our galaxy orbiting, right? We, no, no, that's what our perception's getting stretched and crunched. So what I like to say is that literally – our perceptions are being magnified into existence based off of our accelerated frame of motion. So two questions for you, gentlemen. Um, first and foremost, let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk about gravity. Okay. Um, how, how small can something be before it no longer exerts any type of gravitational effect? So case in point, <laughs> Um, a black hole exerts a lot at the localized area, a lot of gravitational pull. The sun does too, but to a lesser degree. And Jupiter, which is supermassive, also has a, a big gravitational field, but lesser than the sun. The Earth has a gravitational field lesser than Jupiter. We as human beings, if we were sitting out in space, you and I, Alexei, at five feet apart from, event, uh, apart from each other, eventually we would come together because the gravity in me and the gravity in you are going to bring us together. And I suspect the same is even with hypothetically a cell. Take a cell here and a cell here in space and eventually they'll touch. But there comes a point, perhaps, and I don't know. I mean, does it go all the way down to the proton? Does it go down to the electron or does it go down to the to the to the muons and the bosons? I mean, or does it go smaller than that? At what point does something no longer either affected by or um, create its own gravitational field? Or is it the fact that it's matter it will always have, no matter how small it is? Um, I would lead towards like, there was, there's always gravity and it is the synchronization of light state and as above is as below. And from our perception, um, I would say maybe the Planck size would be the smallest from our perception. But if so you if were there's to- there's mass, show, there's gravity is what you're saying. There's, well, yeah, I mean, from, yeah. That, from well, our reality, right? I have a question. But those I are have all. A question. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, it's it's accepted today, mark you know, contemporary physics, right? That quantum mechanics deals with things on that level because they they have a, a different relationship with things on our scale, right? That's what, why why do we have quantum mechanics if things act, you know, respond, or, you know, the same way at that level as they do at our our scale? Well, it's hard to say that they're not responding at the same level. Um, if you were to say, you know, zoom into the and you now become a Planck sized consciousness, how do we know that gra the gravity and everything isn't really the same? Or could it be that we are the closest to that nth degree than we think we are? Right. Maybe there is an, a maybe there is the smallest thing and we're closer than we think we are to that point. 
It was interesting, Eric Weinstein, he said, um, gravity's exceptionally weak on us. Um, so it is. In, in my, yeah, my view, it comes from, uh, it's, it's uh, like a higher dimensional kind of force. I've, I've heard that before, that, that gravity is leaching somewhere else. Uh, and that's why it's because it should be much, much stronger uh, when you compare it to the other fundamental forces, uh, you know, the electromagnetic force and the nuclear force and whatnot. Let me ask you guys this, and since we're talking about matter, and this is not a trick question, because I, I, again, this is something that I ponder sometimes at night uh, with a, I shouldn't say this, but with a nice cigar and maybe a, a, a glass of scotch. Uh, by the way, I don't condone smoking for the record, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, like I'm, I'm Cuban, right? I'm Latin. So I've got a couple of vices and, and smoking a cigar occasionally is one of them. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, when I, when I ask what the question is, what is matter? What is mass? Right. People say, well, it's stuff. It's, it's stuff and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm obviously made of the earth is made of matter and rock and, 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 and I'm made of matter. Right. And so we can go down further and then we could say, well, a cell is made of matter. It's made of atoms, right? I'm made of cells and my cells are made of atoms. Okay, well, what are those atoms made out of? Well, those atoms are made out of subatomic particles, right? And you can get into the quarks and all these other stuff and the wimps and the bosons and whatnot. But, but at some point, you get down to a basic fundamental element that is non-divisible. And the question is, what is that made of? Because ultimately, you know, we look at matter as something being solid because we live at this macro level. And I look at my phone and the, you know, my, my pen and my glasses. But... But Alexei, I'd be really curious in yours, Chris, and yours, Tony, what you guys think when you get down to the smallest, smallest where that matter can no longer be subdivided into anything else. It's either there or it's not. What is it? Um, what What is it? Can I guess what Alexei is going to answer? <laughs> Alexei, you got to yeah. think of what you're going to answer. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Uh, there is no divisible point. It, it, it keeps going. It's a... Uh... That's, I think, is that what you're going to say, Alexei? That's where I'd be headed towards, yeah. And it really just comes down to <laughs> harmonization. Um, we have a brain. We have a consciousness. It it needs to harmonize with the field of energy that exists in order to, for us to have an experience within our realm to begin with. And so I think that when you look at just waves, nature, and you look at the types of waves that exist within human consciousness, meaning delta through fast gamma, um, you need to understand that each one is kind of harmonizing with a different um, frequency because it, I mean, it, every frequency has a size, right? And when it comes to human conscious harmonics, they multiply by two. Um, and so every wave essentially needs to harmonize. And when it comes to us being able to perceive the manifested realm, uh, you need to be in your alpha beta or slow gamma state of consciousness. I think once you get to fast gamma, you have out of body. And once you're in, and you're in theta, you're dreaming. So our only conscious perception lies within alpha, beta, and slow gamma. I think fast gamma is already the next. Um, you're already kind of removing yourself from our physical realm. And so, and human the size of the brain, well. right? It's the size of the brain that that makes that. Delta Not necessarily state, the right? size of the brain. It's the it's the frequencies that can exist within the brain. Because in order for something to create a frequency, it either needs to pendulate back and forth or it needs to rotate. And so, when you think about light right? And the speed of light and the acceleration of light. In order for something to have a frequency of one hertz, it needs to be accelerating towards center at light speed while orbiting. And so that's a specific distance, specific time. Um, and then when you think about just natural doubling nature of reality, the next harmonic that comes into experience is theta. And so if you want to multiply that times, you know, say it's accelerating towards center at light speed, but orbiting, that has a certain diameter. And so each one of those diameters fractal in um, to be one fourth of the diameter of the wave that's bigger. And um, you can say that's the field of experience that you're harmonizing with. So can I ask a question real quick before I forget? So are we saying basically that that um, contemporary, you know, science as we know it now may, is going to be totally reliant on this unified theory that we don't have? In other words, at some point, quantum mechanics and uh, relativity will have to be, there will have to be that unified theory that comes into play before we really understand as far as what you know is so that we can apply science to think you know a well, new scientific method tool. that's that's the first question what lou just asked actually is the first question i ask in my fifth book called the fifth dimension i say what is matter and what is light and, I, and then my kind of my answer to that is aren't they the same energy being perceived in two different ways all created by a single motion 
I think it's more, and that would be the interdimensional telescope. Uh, I guess the, the yes. idea is that the brain is actually more of a receiver um, yeah, than it is as a producer, right? We think that the you live, uh, well, I guess if you, I thought before uh, that you are what's in your brain, right? If I just download yeah. my brain into a computer, then, uh, you know, that'll be me and the computer. Um, but you look at um, it, when people lose parts of their brain, right? They uh, Weird things happen. If you look at disassociate identities, this is probably the biggest Example for me, uh, if you have someone with multiple identities um, and one of those identities is blind, when that identity has a, executive control, then the person is effectively blind. Um, so, and this has been true to be, you know, it's, it's a fact. Um, so that's multiple identities, you can no, be blind, the same person can be blind. Um, I wasn't also, aware of that. Yeah. that is I've also talked to, uh, I have a close friend, he's a doctor, I haven't relayed this on air. Um, but he he has met uh, a, 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 a girl, she was six, uh, and all she had was a brainstem. Um, but she was able to communicate to him. Um, uh, so I guess the point is, the argument is that it's more of a, a, a receiver. And uh, well, the, the, the waves that your brain can pick up is going to be the, the perception that you are seeing. I wanted to, the, wanted to ask you a story real quick. The, the girl that only had the brainstem, she wasn't communicating with, with her voice. She was communicating telepathically to the doctor. Yes. He's yeah. a good friend so that, of mine. He a, told me in confidence. Yeah. Wow. He said he could communicate wow. with her telepathically. As soon as he walked in the room, uh, she couldn't talk at all. She was uh, catatonic on the floor. And he said, Tell, you know, are you talking to me? And uh, she said, yes. And he said, well, show me. Give me a sign or whatever. And he said she was catatonic. And she just looked at him like that. And he was like, whoa. And uh, so he wow. worked with the mothers in Switzerland. Um, and said, yeah, no, this is, she's not catatonic. Um, she's there and it healed them. And yeah, yeah. anyway, crazy there story. Was a language barrier involved as well, right? Like I'm the sorry? Language the language barrier, like she didn't yeah, speak Yeah, so she didn't language. speak English. He said yeah. he's, he's American and she, the girl did not know Swedish. I'm sorry, Swiss. Uh, the girl did not know English and she was communicating with him and she could see through his eyes. So he said she, uh, he walked over to uh, the CD rack and she said, yeah, go down. And he's like, this one, this one, this one. And she said, no, stop. And he pulled out the CD and they said, which songs? And she said, this one, this one, this one. In his brain, he was saying it, but it wasn't him. And then uh, he showed it to the mother. And she's like, yeah, those are his favorite. Those are her favorite uh, songs. And the brother could wow. could communicate with her. Um, but uh, the um, I guess the psychologist said, hey, don't don't talk. Don't do that because it's it's not healthy and whatever. So I. Crazy story. He told me that last weekend, actually, he was crying when he said it, he said it changed his life. Um, so that the, the idea of this interdimensional telescope is that the experiences you we see per, perception, um, maybe we can alter somehow the frequencies uh, that we're in some sort of sphere, right? If we can electrically charge it, if we can change uh, that light state that Alexei is talking about, maybe yep. we'll be able to experience a different dimension, meaning you could see uh, i guess i don't know how you would describe experience a different dimension like say but um, well uh, you know I, i've often described it when people say well you know what how do you describe something beyond the third dimension and I, i've often told people look um you know in a, in a three-dimensional world we have th three axes right you have an x axis a y axis and a z axis meaning i can go for example in late 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 terms i can go forward and backwards i can go left and right and i can go up and down and and a variation of those allows me to have any point in a three-dimensional space. A fourth dimension might be, for example, if you were a human being and you didn't go anywhere, you just got smaller. You started to withdraw. You started to go inward, right? You're not going outwards in any particular direction. You're actually going in to the universe. Um, that may be a very, you know, a very rudimentary way to explain of what a fourth dimension could be experienced like. You're not going forward, back, left, or right, or up, or down at all. You're actually going inside. Yes. Um, and, you know, that's that's a very, again, very crude way to explain it that people can kind of conceptualize and say, oh, I see. I'm not really going in any direction. I'm actually I'm actually getting getting smaller. And that in itself is another dimension, because right now my body mm -hmm. occupies this dimension. Well, if my body wasn't here and I could experience that space now, that could be potentially yeah. another another example of a dimension. Um, you know, I, I, my concern is that I've had my frustration is that. We so we know so little about about our own universe. We know so little about our own planet. We know so little about our own psychology, and and we know so little about our own species. We know so little about about, about human consciousness. 
it's 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 frustrating for me when people look at this the the what's in front of us and say okay this is it this is this is the universe when we know that 99.9 percent of the universe is beyond our ability to interact with it's either in the scale of things it's either too big or too small um, or it's just simply beyond like you said the five fundamental senses in which we we judge our our environment touch taste hear smell whatnot uh, you know we tend to think if it doesn't exist if we don't we can't use our senses it does it's not real and yet this is living proof this little phone here that you know it sees a universe in wi-fi and in gps and in cell signal and am fm uh, this little simple device imagine if you had cell phone vision right and you could see the world through a cell phone not just elect not not just you know electro-optically but but through all the ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum yeah your perception of the universe would probably be considerably different. You would, you would, you would relate to things and see things that, that right now we have, we have no clue about just simply because we don't have the equipment, the natural equipment to, to, to detect it and to, and to interact with it. Yeah. I think that relates a lot to what I like to call the line of sight. Um, and I don't want to get too, too much into this really, but basically, um, we're born into, like you just said, you just appeared on earth. Chris just appeared on earth. Right. And we have our perceptions. Um, so you can say we're born into a flow of space. Um, and you can either drift inward or you can drift outward as far as dimensions of experience and your ability to see. And the easiest way for me to describe it is that each dimension of experience is a tighter spiral versus a bigger spiral. And if you're, an addict, for example, um, your line of sight is a 30 minute spiral. That's your experience and that's your conscious perception. That's your ability to actually see and interact with the universe is your line of sight. Because at the end of the day, all we really have is a conglomeration of human perceptions and we're doing our best to describe reality, right? And so if your line of sight is a tiny little inward spiral of addiction, um, that's the furthest you will see. And now when you want to think about all of humanity um, being born into fractals of different delusions, like someone born in Russia versus someone born in Ukraine versus someone born in the United States and China, we're all born into these spirals of line of sights, different lines of sight. And so as you remove your what you what you use to identify yourself, I am right. I am an addict. I am a Russian. I am, you know, you know, what I'm saying like my, I'm, I'm just making up things like so I am a. An American, I am. So as you remove your I am's and your delusions, your line of sight actually increases and you connect you, your dimension of experience gets bigger. Um, and so when you're in a bigger experience, you can look into someone who's in a smaller experience. For example, any, so, any normal person can look into the spiral of a drug addict and be like, oh, well, he's addicted to drugs. Right. So you're, as you increase your spiral, you can look into the delusions of smaller spirals. So why is it as humans then we we are are stuck in these spirals? Why why is it that you know we uh, we collectively as a species tend to self-identify um, as some specific identity, whether it is national or religious or organizationally or socially, we tend to group ourselves into these little herds or packs, if you will and self-identify if that is what's actually holding us back from experiencing, you know, the bigger part of the universe. Well, yeah. Why were we given egos? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, gravity. Um, I think that's kind of the force at a higher dimension. So my, if uh, my actual theory, Lou is, um, you know, our, our, we're made of uh, many different cells, right? I already mentioned kind of trillions of cells. I believe that yeah, um, we're a collective, right? I mean, we really, yeah. at the end of the day, we are, we, we identify, so this is me, but in reality, it's not me, it's we, because we are, I'm a collective yes. of, of, of microorganisms. Exactly. And I think it, it, we just stop at us at the human level, you know, as we go down, you know, you're made up of little organisms, you know, little cells working together, little teams, you know, they die in your organism. They're born more born every day. They do their little jobs. Um, and so I, you mentioned, why do we do that? What we do. I think it's actually we're little stem cells. You know, if you look at humans, uh, we can we can be trained, we can be propagandized, and we grow into little groups. You know, so it's like the gravity of our dimension, um, and and we build up you, a larger organism. 
So then that that asks the, the the question that we always have in mathematics that the sum can never be greater than its constituent parts. But is the human being or is sentient life just that? Is it that you now reach a critical point, a critical mass of collectives, organisms, of cells organizationally, where all of a sudden the we now identifies as a single organism, as a me, and now all of a sudden... I, the, mm -hmm. the, the collection of all these cells that make up Lou Elizondo, something happens, it reaches this critical mass where all of a sudden it becomes sentient, self-aware, and now it, it, it is truly a single organism. Is there some sort of connective tissue, so to speak, uh, you know, obviously proverbially, amongst those smaller living organisms that now create, you know, a, 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 single, a, a single consciousness? Sentience. No, that relates to what Chris always likes to say, like, like uh, every country is an organism, right? Because the people kind of. Well, that's know, my point. That's exactly. exactly where I was going with. And, and the planet yeah. is an organism, right? Exactly. And, you yeah. could, and, and frankly, you can keep continue going out, as you say, from, 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 as a fractal perspective, you know, uh, enough of anything potentially could have its uh, could, you know, but. I mean, I'm, I'm no different than matter that's in me. The atoms that are in me are the same atoms that are in the earth and that are the same atoms on the moon and everything else. Uh, is this where some people, and again, I don't know, I'm asking the question hypothetically, is this where some people have the notion that everything in the universe is connected? Perhaps is that, is that where they're, 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 they're getting that from? I, I mean, can I answer this? I guess, um, yeah, yeah the, I mentioned the dissociated identity. Um, so there's just, this is one theory I like is analytic idealism. Um, basically is what it's saying is everything we perceive the perceivable universe is actually like a dissociated identity inside of a larger super, you could say, organism or another universe. Um, so basically, the uh, the idea is each one of us would actually be a uh, dissociated identity from whatever is out there, the, the rest of the universe. And, you know, when you die, essentially, that manifestation stops. And you go back into the proverbial collective. whatever's out there. Yeah, the collective. So in essence, we are the a cell. Each one of us is a cell in a bigger organism, and we are self-aware of ourselves, but also part of a, a larger, again, I'm using the term loosely organism. I don't mean a living, breathing thing. What I mean is a, you know, a, 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 a larger collection. Of, no, no. I mean, uh, literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. I want to say that. Paradigm um, shift. No, no, I mean, literally, Lou, 100%. Um, we think we are the top organism on this planet. And we're, I, I argue vehemently that we're not. If you just, if you look easily, if you look at America, look at nations, you know, I could look at why Russia invaded Ukraine. If you just, you know, you're going to think about it, you could analyze it, but how are you really going to analyze it? It's not what Putin himself thought the man, right? It's everything related to Putin. It's the culture, the religion, mm -hmm. the the GDP, the everything, you know. And, and it's you a, it's a culmination it, of yeah. things, not just. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. As far as I, I think. A real living, breathing organism that doesn't that lacks sentience and logic. <laughs> That's I mean, look at all the dumb things that all of our countries have done. Well, a, 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 anyway. I mean, a, pl a plant does that, right? Plants don't really necessarily have a conscience like 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 you know sentience like we have, but yet they're living, breathing organisms, and they are part of life, you know. Um, but they don't have, you know, the the brain capacities that we have. We don't, you know, at least we don't thing to do right um we, we don't associate a plant as having the same qualitative and quantitative um value that a, that a human has right uh, and yet it is very much alive it is very much a a living breathing organism i like to think of it as just a big pool of energy you know that we all swim in you know as far as being connected you know and th to me there there has to be some um I don't know, even if it's a, a less dense mass that we are, even if that's dark energy somehow, and we're, right. we're all in it, and that's that's how we're connected. I don't know. That's well, the way I think. So, so let me ask you this then. Yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Well, just a quick point on that. You know, like um, an example of that is quantum entanglement, right? Even on opposite sides of the universe, you can, or I don't know how far, let's say, it goes, but if you push one, uh, you know, cork or something here. The other will instantly react across yeah. the universe. Spooky action yeah. at a distance. 
Correct. Yep. And it's a, a yep. far distance. Yep. It, it's I mean, that's, already, distance. that's what yeah. made me think of this pool of energy that, that is connected. That should already tell scientists that energy can yeah. or information can travel faster than the speed of light. It's like uh, like watching a football game, right? Um, you're watching a football game at your house. I'm watching a football game at my house, maybe even using different cameras. Um, but when a play happens, right, you have your perspective on it. I have my perspective on it. It effectively happens at the exact same time, right, in different locations in our universe. So I, it's just another, I guess, uh, point of evidence for that all connected thing. So let me, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of dare to say something that tends to sometimes be a bad word and, and sometimes it's <laughs> not. So we talk about matter. We talk about the physical universe. We talked about gravity. We talked about sentience and, and maybe even to some degree what, what consciousness is about. What we haven't talked yet about is then where does spirituality come into play? Now, most people know that I don't, I don't hypothesize and I don't offer my opinions and, and things like this because I simply don't know. But, but if we're going to go down the rabbit hole, let's just for a moment, if you don't mind, indulge me or humor me. Um, is there something then beyond just interacting with a field? Is, 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 is there another additional element to sentience? that is indelible that is not necessarily relegated to a physical world um and it is it is it is something else now again i use the word loosely spirituality because i don't know what else to call it i, I don't mean spirituality in a, in a classic sense where you know we light candles and we burn incense what i mean is true spirituality what is that extra ingredient for example let's look at the emotion of love right it's something completely illogical. It doesn't make sense, right? And yet it is a fundamental driving force for many human beings. We do things that are that are actually against the interests of our own biology. And we will go risk our lives to save somebody else because of love, because of maternal instinct and things like that. Things that you can't measure, you can't see no matter what type of equipment you have. And yet most people agree it is it is a very real emotion. Um what is your thoughts on on that on spirituality and and the universe and 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 the physical world um so i wrote um the infinite pool of experience and awareness which is basically i try to keep it as physics related as possible um i wrote a book after that called the physics of love um and it's called uh, physics of love synchronicity and um what am i getting at oh man i'm kind of like spacing out right now uh, talking about spirituality, we have what, talked what about this. Is... We, yeah, we had a whole uh, argument on it. Uh, Tony says he argues definitely that there is <laughs> a physical world, um, and and Alexei is basically saying, from what I understand, is that oh, it, it's all just, just manifestation I'm just saying, of, uh, of perception. I remember yeah, I'm that. Just saying I don't see the harm in there being both, right? The, I don't, I don't, I'm not threatened by the physical world like some people seem to be. I think that we were given the physical world to be able to enjoy our, you know, enjoy it, right? It's almost like a gift to me. And that's where the spirituality comes in, that this physical world is a gift to us so that we can enjoy it physically and we're not just all floating around spiritually, you know, somehow. You know, communicating so, so tell me, what's more, what's more real then? Is the physical world more real or, and natural, or is the spiritual world more real and natural? Can't they both have equal weight, or can't they? Yeah, both they have... can. They can. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm asking you because that's what I'm saying. You know, I, I think, I, I think it, that 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 our Creator gave us these this physical reality so that to you know so that we can enjoy it, you know. That's all. Now, I mean, Chris, I, I know you've you look like yeah. you've got something else you want to add, to that, or, <laughs> I, or, or I mean, disagree um, or agree. No, I, I and I, I was a hardcore atheist really until last year, really until this came up. Um, I thought there was nothing else. We just turned into uh, worm food, essentially. Um, but now I'm you know I'm on a, a spiritual path, if you will. Uh, and what I found is uh, kind of the um, uh, that, like I mentioned, is basically dissociated identity. Uh, and and it, that would relate to, I think, most of the religions. You know, if you look, all, all of the religions, as far as I understand, I've done limited, you know, research and I've read the, the Quran and I've read a few other holy books, um, is basically there is like a oneness, um, right? And, and that seems to make sense to me in terms of 
we are dissociated identities of a, of a oneness uh, that we'll go back to, right? So if you, you're a pedophile, uh, I think <laughs> what's going to happen when you die is you're going to realize that you're also going to live as the pedophilie, um, you know? So I, I think it will uh, kind of, everything will come back. And, and the, the reason I think the driving force is um, you have, uh, it is a search for meaning. That's just what I think. And I think it's a search Chris, for meaning. Yeah. Really interesting what you, what you just said. And I want to share something with you and I don't want to cut you off, but, but this no, is, it, it's fascinating. You say this because I had a, a, a really good conversation with uh, a dear friend of mine and I won't say who, but you know, guys very much into philosophy and, and by the way, very qualified and he opined something and he, he, he explained it to me in very lay terms, which is often what I appreciate because I'm, <laughs> I'm not, so, I'm, not a, I'm not so smart. Um, he um, he explained it a bit like, uh, imagine you have this vat of copper, pure copper at the U.S. Mint, and they are, they're going to make a bunch of pennies for the month. And so they have this huge cauldron of, of boiling pure copper, and they make all these little pennies, and those pennies wind up getting going into circulation. And over time, those pennies, because of the natural state of, of, of the universe and how, how, how entropy works and whatnot, um, they start to rust. They start to oxidize. They start to take on the patina of the environment, right? And then at some point in time when the pennies have outlived their usefulness, they go back to the U.S. Mint, at least in theory. They get melted down. The slag and the oxidation is scraped off the top. And those pennies go back to the hot cauldron of collectiveness, back to the one, to the big, to the big hot pool of copper, pure copper, uh, only to, you know, potentially go back out again and to eventually make another penny and, and be recycled. Um, I found that very interesting. Again, I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to it one way or the other, but, but it reminded me of that conversation I had with my friend when you just said what you said. Um, do you mind if I, if I step in here real quick? So basically, um, yeah. I kind of remember what I was getting at with the uh, physics of love is that you could think of um, all of humanity as a single crystal, um, meaning our conscious experience is all trying to harmonize, right? Like we're, we're, we all have our own wants, don't wants, assumptions and expectations. And you could almost consider that the rest of a, a, a pure human, right? One, one without delusion, you could say is a perfect crystal. And then when you have delusion, you could say they're like little um, bits of rust that exist on it. And when it comes to the manifestation of our energy, it comes from the outer realms of experience as well as the inner realms of experience. But in order for our universe, our perception to have been created to begin with, outer realms of energy must have harmonized to begin with as energy drifts inwards, creating denser experiences. And so as this energy drifts inwards, it creates new harmonics of conscious experience. Um, but then it, that, also ties back into what you were saying about the melting of a rock and the raising of a pure material and to recrystallize a structure. Um, when it comes to, you could say that now we have this very distorted crystal of human consciousness where we all have our own wants, don't wants, assumptions and expectations. And if you relate that to a cell of a living being, imagine if your skin cells were fighting each other or it's called you, cancer, you get it's cancer. cancer, right? Yeah. And so now when yeah. you relate that to the entire human population, um, we're very, I, I like to say grainy is, is the word I use. Like we all live in our own grains of conscious creation. And, there was um, one, sorry, one really good example you gave uh, that I think relates is the, the two speakers, Alexei. So if right. you imagine there's, there's two speakers at a certain distance, Lou, and they're playing this, uh, the same music, right? If you can get them to a certain distance, uh, you won't hear them, right? Ultimately, you can get the waves to cancel out. Is this correct? Like noise canceling headphones. Right. Uh, essentially. Yeah. Um, and you can also get them, depending on the distance, you can get them to to be stereo, right, where they're synchronized. And you can also have them yeah. where they're not synchronized. And now all of a sudden yeah. you're you're getting, you know, a lag or a delay and it's not it's not harmonious. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned something interesting, Alexei, about what you and forgive me, because I, I don't this is a new term for me. Creative delusion um, in, in the human being, um, this 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 notion that we are um, each individualistic and, and, and kind of, you know, our own perception of reality. Is that something that is natural to the human being to create these, these, these delusions? Uh, is it part of a protective or defense mechanism for the species that we have developed? And, and 
it, do other animals that we see in nature also have this quote unquote characteristic of creative that, that's a great question and i've never been asked that question um it is a result of the environment that we live within um the reason i created skate case is because i need to make money um the reason i need to make money is because i was born into a fractal of human creation um so now we all live our lives based off of a fractal. I'm, I'm trying to be very careful when I speak here. Like, so now we all, not everyone, right? But many people base their lives off of these fractals of human creation and not off of the earth and being harmonious with reality. So you just destroyed my, uh, my body as being a gift to me from not the creator i felt no, things it's a prison you, anything you sound I born create, into a delusion anything i create is a fractal of my delusion D um, tony your now, body is a gift to everybody <laughs> thank you that beer that beer mine. Sure, that beer. <laughs> i've Nobody got lots mine. of gravity the mass here yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we can just move forward from that yeah we're good <laughs> <laughs> well it, it is kind of right. funny though because you know if you if it, it kind of goes back to the perception or people's perception of spirituality, right? Uh, you know, I was, I was brought up in the church, so I have a different perspective of spirituality than someone who wasn't, you know, and I had to go, I went through this my entire life of trying to remove that. Okay. I'm not calling Christianity a delusion, but under, under Alexei's definition of delusion, it basically is right. And it's not, a, it's not a, um, a delusion. I'm not trying to, you know, obviously, I still believe in Jesus, you know. So, did Jesus I, walk around saying, "Be a Christian"? No. So, just you know, did the Buddha walk around say, "Be a Buddhist"? No. So that's kind of my point: is that I have, I have, uh, in the past fifty years, I've removed, I've tried to remove those delusions. Um, but it doesn't get stuff done, right? Like I was thinking about that today, Alexei. Is you imagine Nirvana, you the Bu the Buddha, right? He's at one. He's uh creating perfectly laminar flow. Um, but then, you know, Russia isn't invading Ukraine, you know, with people laying around, you know, in perfect laminar flow, you know, it's, it's with people working. Yeah, and, and totally. I made a made video to do stuff for the, I made a video movement. right before we went online and it's a 22 second video. And I, I had a dream last night, right? Um, I, I need to make this video. I'm gonna make it today. The, I, I basically said, um, we create our realities today. I'm planting a tree. And I, and I put a couple seeds in the ground and that was it. 20 second video. But, but my, my um, screen on YouTube that shows the video is basically Ukrainians or Russians holding like a big rocket launcher, right? Clickbait. So now they're going to click on that and then they're going to be like, whoa, we create our reality. We could all just be planting a tree. Yes. Let me ask you something, guys. Um, let's, let's go back to, uh, let's do a quick mental exercise here. Um, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Let's go back to the analogy in the beginning of our conversation where we said, okay, all of a sudden now, Alexei or Chris or, or Tony, you guys just pop into existence one day. Nobody's around you. There's nothing else around you. Where do you start on this journey of, because everything we have in our universe right now in our life is based upon what other people tell us. And this is how we learn. We learn from each other as a species. But if no one's there to tell you what, stars are or planets and you are now all of a sudden poof you pop into existence there's not another human being around you and you're just in space looking around and you see points of light but you don't even know what light is you just they're there right um how do we then at that point do we do we go through existence if we never come into contact with another human being where our, our perception of life in the universe is fundamentally different uh, or is a fact that, you know, I guess my point is, does does not just our perception of the universe, but does the universe itself actually change once you have another human being now in the calculus? Because if it's just you alone in the universe and there's no one to tell you anything and you are brand new, born into the universe, poof, now you're here and you're looking around, you know, what then do we make of 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 our state is there a thing called an ego right and and self-awareness and self-identity if there's no one else around you to compare to right it's just mm -hmm. you and now the universe yeah i like to say that like perception is um 
very similar to what you say. We live in the smooth pond of the universe. Now you imagine the earth with no mind. Um, it's the smooth pond of the universe. And then you have a human gets dropped into it, right? And they have their own wants, don't wants, assumptions and expectations based off of the delusions that have been instilled throughout a life. And so those are pebbles of energy being tossed into a, a pond. And they create ripples that go outward. And so now you put another person here, you put another person here, you put a person over there. All these ripples emulating outward from my body are overlapping with your, you know, the ripples you're sending out with the ones that Chris is sending out with artists and Tony sending out. And that creates a very distorted natural existence. But the way I like to think about creation is though, is that all of the energy is in our universe, right? That exists in our, in our, in our bubble of our universe, right? And when a human is created, that's a, that's assembling, you know, matter and whatever into a, a being that has, that will then become sentient, right? So it's, it's, a um, you know, whoever, you know, our creator takes that existing energy and creates of being you know from the microscopic level right if you think about it, it comes from the microscopic level grows through all those dimensional levels and then becomes us right um, right yeah. and that's how well, you can, so that's how you can look at it as you know on a spiritual level without there being a, a textbook you know that's how we can relate it more to the, an overall yeah. creator than just we, we just think that growth is stopping at us lou it's from dna you imagine we just we assume it stops at us Right, because we die. But I, I just, I'm just arguing. Just don't stop at a human. Just keep going. Sure. So, yeah. so let me ask you this. And again, I know this is completely not at all involving UAPs. This entire conversation. So <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't, I haven't derailed the conversation. It's more fun. Uh, <laughs> but let me ask you this. So, so as you're saying, uh, Tony, is that you know that the creator creates the vessel for our 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 growth and our ability to to be our spiritual self to to experience the universe my question for you is this then is you know the old saying is i think therefore i am but is it also possible i am and therefore i think right so my question is 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 it that this is created for something inside to reside and experience the universe or the fact that this exists now there is something inside to experience the universe you know I, I, again chicken what i'm hoping is yeah you know, what i'm hoping uh, is that that the thing that we call our spirit exists all the time you know infinitely and that this container was created just for this ex experience on earth That's so this is a container and yeah. it's it's for, for something else whereas instead of this being um how should i say that you know the coca-cola exists because the coke bottle exists but what you're saying is the coke bottle exists so the coca-cola can exist yeah and hopefully when this body's gone and you know like uh, think who was it chris you said so it worm, can manifest worm, so worm the food. Can manifest. <laughs> when this body is you know fertilizer my, i can still you know keep existing so can ai have a point where artificial intelligence where it has enough processes and computations where it too can become self-aware meaning that now we've created a container for some sort of set is it i guess my question is it possible for ai to ever be sentient i think i think so i think it, it's gonna it's gonna have to develop i think maybe smarter people will have to uh, develop it to, for it to get to that point I know Elon Musk is really concerned about that that situation. I, I think but, that's what we're building now with the global. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's going to take several more generations of uh, you know human programming. <laughs> I, I, so then, where does at, that sentience come from? Hmm. If 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 we create a a, a a bottle, then 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 at what point does that sentience, that conscious, now all of a sudden? Where is it coming from in order for it to occupy that artificial intelligence? The, 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 That's a good point the, because you, that, in, that insinuates that the, if there's a creator, that it's allowing it's uh, allowing sentience to become part of the artificial intelligence, right? Is that right. kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. And again, I don't have any. I'm not. These aren't trick questions. These are just. I'm just asking <laughs> hypotheticals here because yeah. we are a carbon-based unit, but you know, if you have now a silicone-based <laughs> unit that can do the same processes intellectually that we do basically replicate the brain then at what point does does that become a living breathing conscious sentient organism that is just like us it's just not carbon-based and if so where does that come from 
and and who decides that okay now we're at a critical point where consciousness can consciousness can now reside in that instead of you know this flesh and and, and blood vessel i'm going to put it in silicone and and you know tin and nickel so Lou, is this a breadcrumb? Are you telling us that after we're after humans? We're I'm not, become... guys. I, <laughs> this is this is we are. Let me, for the record, if, I, if I could take a stab at it, um, I am what I think I am, but to you, I am whatever you think I am. Um, I played a lot with that, and I played a lot with my ego, you could say. And um, you know, you take off your hats, and and um, not, I'm not saying you take off your hats and stuff, but I'm, I'm saying like when you take off your work hats and your ego. You end up jumping into the delusion of what people think you are and so that's why you have to use your ego in certain points to steer through the delusion and re remove yourself of the negative minds that may be projecting onto you um but when it comes to sentient life and at what point does it become sentient i've been looking a lot at our own human uh, experience and when from my understanding our consciousness our conscious experience is somewhat the overlapping of energies being created being projected from another dimension. I like to use the fifth dimension because I like to say that our four dimension of uh, space and time, like our perception of time is the fourth dimension. So I always say the fifth dimension. Uh, so at what point does energy synchronize to create a conscious experience? And so when you think about the circadian rhythm of the human um, and you think about how each one of those waves, delta, theta, alpha, beta, slow gamma, and fast gamma relates to different layers and, and distances, you can actually make a map of your conscious experience through the dimension of conscious density. And when you do that map, it basically mimics a gyroscope hanging on a string at a 90 degree angle. But then what I did was I went ahead and so I realized that's a gyroscope hanging on a string at a 90 degree angle. So basically it shows that our consciousness is the synchronization of six or so energies that are tidally locked in the fifth dimension and so when you have fifth dimensional tidal locking i would say that's the spark of a conscious experience so you mentioned alexei the word energy a lot and and this last hour and 20 minutes we've been talking i asked you what is matter i've asked you what is gravity let me ask you this what is what is energy because i think a lot of people when you say energy you know you hear all sorts of people say well energy is like electricity energy is that thing that flows through all of us and people some people get metaphysical some people get very you know scientific about it what is fundamentally at the most fundamental level what is energy it is the fluid of experience is it <laughs> tangible is it is it can you can you i mean we, we can harness energy we can equate it, we can use it we can this and that it but at the end of the day like i don't think i mean is it like gravity where it's really elusive it's i mean we all know it's there but we really don't understand it very well isn't it just the potential in, in all all of creation i, I like the way I that mean, tony just said uh, it, it's pressured it's the differences between here and here is a potential energy is a potential Right. Because and light so, is energy, action. heat is energy. I like that. I like that. So I'm gonna Sound go with this. Energy. Right, right. So it's a potential. And when it comes to our most advanced sense, our because I in one of my books I go, I, I go through the evolution of the human senses, and I say we have a sixth sense, a seventh sense, and that would be of potentiality. It's our sense of love versus our sense of no love. Um, just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Yeah. What's funny though, Lou, is I got this feeling when we were talking about AI. I, I had this vision of of humans evolving into nothing but artificial intelligences with sentience. Like you well, were some has some have speculated that is our, our the yeah, natural that way that's of the our next evolution. phase and and are these beings waiting on us to make that maybe we're too maybe we've we've discovered them at an early phase and we're not worthy yet to understand or even even be introduced to them in some manner. I don't yeah. know. I mean, certainly intriguing, right? I mean, we don't even understand ourselves. How the hell are we going to understand something that is, you know, completely, you know, outside of our our our, our current understanding of, of of our paradigm? You know, we look right. at everything very myopically in as it relates to mm -hmm. to our experiences. But something that lies outside of it's like it's like saying describe something that lays outside of the universe. Well, you have no perspective to do that. It's <laughs> it's, it's it's almost an illogical question because everything that i have in in my head and the way i think is based upon my observations 
being inside the universe to say, well, think about being outside the universe. Well, what does that mean? What, what, what does that look like? Right. And that, that's where I always say, um, will a worm ever be able to understand human politics? And then, so the next question that kind of goes with that, just relating it more to our topic today, could a human cell, like the single, like one of my skin cells, could that ever really be aware of our world? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and maybe given enough time, it will. Maybe, maybe right. you know, we, we were a worm, right? And we've, over time, we've, yes, we've developed into what you see now. And, that's what science maybe, says, yes, sir. I'm going with it. Well, that's, <laughs> that cell is relegated to a system at this point in time. Right. Just like we as humans may be relegated to part of a system that we're going to evolve into at some point in time. But the uh... and Tony, let me preface if I can real quick, guys, everything I've asked so far are obviously I'm just I'm asking you hypotheticals. I want to make it clear to your audience that I don't subscribe necessarily one way or the other. We're just we're just having a philosophical conversations on on, on what ifs, you know, and, and, and understand each other's maybe ideas and whatnot. But I do want to make it clear right now, you know, before this ends that I, you know, but people say, oh, Lou's getting all, 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 all spiritual now. And it's no, I'm not. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to tie the UAP phenomenon to anything spiritual. I'm, we're talking about the human condition. And, and I want to know at the end of the day, the yeah. essence of what it means to be human. Can you can you distill what it means to be human? Because I can if I get into combat and I lose my arms, I'm still Lou Elizondo. Right. And I lose my legs. In fact, I'm still Lou Elizondo to the point if you could, you know, cut this off and keep this alive, I'd still have the personality that I have. Um, if I have a traumatic brain injury, well, I'm still Lou Elizondo. So what makes Lou Elizondo or Alexei or Chris or Tony? Tony, what makes you because we're all carbon units, we're all kind of the same and you know, look the same and you know, my radial symmetry and whatnot. But there is something distinctly unique within each and every one of us that makes us unique. And, and where does that reside and what does it look like and where is it? And is it more common throughout the universe? Is it strictly a human thing or it a universe thing, right? And that's where we go into from where I talk about mankind versus mankind. So a lot of people have over the years speculated what I meant by that. That's what I meant by that. You know, it's, it's what, what we use to define ourselves being human may not intrinsically be necessarily a human thing. It may be something much bigger, much broader. Oh, anyone? I was going to say like 90% of our, of our universe of 99% uh, of what is within the physical space of my body is not even viewable or perceivable. Um, so from my perception, you guys are only seeing 1% of me. You're not seeing me what, physically unless so like when I look at you and your body or Tony and his body or Chris and his body, I'm seeing one percent of you. Right. If even. Yeah. Right. That, that's the way I see it. One percent of our potential. One percent <laughs> of your creation of who you are. Well, and there's and there's outside and inside perception, too. Right. So I, I was yeah. talking yesterday on a, on a up to somebody on, on, a, on a little chat and talked about when I, I'm an avid scuba diver and I came across a friend of mine, a colleague of mine came across some, 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 we thought it'd be cool to, you know, swim up to some dolphins. Well, it wasn't such a great idea because they weren't <laughs> dolphins. They were pilot whales and they were echolocating <laughs> off of us. And we realized very quickly that, that they were seeing inside our bodies, basically what they were using this ultra low frequency and high frequency in tandem for sonar, you know, that they're, they're able to not only just see us underwater, but it's like an ultrasound. They're, they're actually seeing what's inside of us at the same time, which is hard for us to understand, right? So they're seeing a whole different perspective of, of me and my buddy than we ever cared to experience. And then there's, of course, the perspective that we have of ourselves, right? I'm talking to you right now, uh, but there is an entire reality because I have eyes and I can only see about 100 and, and you know, roughly 160 degrees either way, my field of right. vision. But right. there's a whole reality, a whole universe occurring behind me that I can't interact with and I can't perceive, but you can, because you're looking at me and there's this whole universe behind me. That's just as real as the universe I see behind you, but you can't perceive it and you can't interact with it because you're too busy looking at my reality that's behind me and I'm looking at yours behind you. And so, you know, again, what that all means at the, in the final analysis, I don't really know, but <laughs> I think it means that we're very myopic. I think we have to understand before we start jumping to conclusions of, you know, this is the way UFOs are and everything else. You know, we have a lot to learn. We we really we really have a lot more questions and answers at this point. And I, I personally think it's wonderful. I think it's 
it's fascinating. I, I'm okay not having all the answers right now. I, I, I'm I, for me, I'm 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 okay by that, and it actually it, it keeps me rather rather humble on the topic because of you, that. Do you mind if I ask a question real quick? Yeah, um, absolutely. Because so I, I've heard one of the concerns being related. We're talking spirituality right now, uh, with you could say angelic beings versus demonic beings. Um, I, I wanted to kind of, I guess, in a way to relate it just to my theory and my understanding, um, there's the different layers of creation and we have our, we have the bigger realms of experience and we have our experience and then we have denser realms of experience. And for our experience to even have harmonized, um, energy must, the outer realm must have harmonized before our, our universe did. And so when it comes to the next layer of perception, that's basically based off of our harmony. So what you're saying is, that if I may, not to cut you off, but I want to see if I get this right. So you're saying in order for our reality to exist, there must have been a, there is another reality that our reality resides in, right? Going kind yes. of back to matter. You can't have mass and matter without a space for that matter and mass to reside in. Correct. It doesn't make sense. So you're saying in order for our universe to exist, there must have been a higher state or higher level of reality in which our universe was created. Right. And so, that right. And so the flow of space we exist within could essentially be the ripples of the wants, don't wants, assumptions and expectations of a higher dimension. And so when it comes to the UFO phenomenon and relating it to, you could say, an angelic and potentially demonic, just based off of the way they say it, I don't like to say that one is bad or good. I don't believe that. Um, sure. But, I understood. I understood what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like a gun is a tool, right? It can be used any way. Um, but basically, you could say that theoretically. <laughs> If they are coming from uh, electromagnetic vortices that are creating a stretching, crunching, and twisting of space, that potentially, um, when an outer realm gets magnified to a point, that would be us perceiving an angelic or outer realm of experience. And when you have um, a point being going bigger, that would be us experiencing something more on the demonic but i don't want to use those words but of a, a, a denser creation you know it's it's interesting <laughs> i remember a convert again another conversation i'll share with you where someone had mentioned the notion of the universe being a little bit like um like a glass of champagne in a nice fluted glass where our universe is a bubble that exists within a multiverse where there's other bubbles around our universe and the superverse is the champagne. It's the liquid that those bubbles reside in, if you will, or the, that connective tissue. Um, you know, unfortunately, like I, said, I don't. Yeah, is that yeah. So, yeah, universe, multiverse within a superverse. The super. Okay. Oh, I and haven't so, heard that. Yeah, I like it. Superverse. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, of course, this is just. I, I'm. I'm relaying to you, and I'm sure I'm not doing a very good. Job, no, you're great. It's perfect. I've had <laughs> yeah. You know, philosophically with other people, but you know, it was. It was. It was interesting for me to to hear it relayed you know with using that analogy because at that point i'm like oh okay well i i, I now i can visualize it i can see it again probably a, a very poor analogy but but it certainly was was it helped me try to understand the concept of what, right. what my friend was discussing right yeah i was on a i've been on a couple shows you know and half halfway through the show it's clear that people don't understand what i'm saying sometimes so i appreciate you know you're very yeah. understanding well, Obviously, again, I'm, I'm very basic. I, I got to yeah. distill things to very simple terms. Like I said, if I was my, right. my wife you, or my kids, uh, you probably wouldn't have to do that. But to me, you got to kind of I, dumb things down sorry. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, can I just uh, ask a question? If you think we're on the right track, Lou. I mean, um, so basically, yeah, we want to try and get these, you know, camera systems out there. Uh, we want Chris, get there's no wrong track. Uh, uh, yeah. Every track is a right track because we're just, we're embarking. Right now, any direction we go in is probably the right direction because we, we're we're just now embarking on this you. journey together. Uh, I don't think there is a wrong direction. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, when you're at the South Pole, any direction you go is north. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, I think I think we're I think we're there, and I think this is precisely the kind of conversations we need to have because ultimately we're talking about we're talking about human sociology and, and human anthropology and the way we look and think about the universe and ourselves. And in order to understand something that is beyond that, we have to kind of relearn how to think to some degree. 
we have to to recognize that we can't look at a um, we can't look at an exceptional problem uh, using unexceptional ways of thinking. Um, it, it's exceptional for a reason, and so I, I think. You know, my 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 recommendation is cast a wide net um, and and try to you know see see what pops up. There is there is no wrong way to think about this. The only thing that's wrong is when people try to monopolize a conversation and tell people what to think. That's that for me is a problem. That 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 I think is a no go. And we see a lot of that in this community where people are trying to hijack the conversation and force a narrative. That that to me is that's wrong. But other than that, I, I think we should explore everything. I think we need our the best and brightest, not just scientists, but academics and philosophers and theologians and and get everybody on board this train because it's going to take all of us to try to try to figure this out and what it means to us. That, that's just my opinion. What I see, honestly, is um, the people who are having the hardest time with this are the ones that that want, that are holding on to their delusions. And I love that term ever since I've met Alexei, I can't let go of it, you know, because it, it kind of opens the door to understanding that as, as long as you go through life with the blinders on, you know, then you're always going to have this uh, uh, perception or your, you know, of life and it has to meet that definition. Right. I, I just want to make the point that I'm yeah. not saying this is all it is. I'm not saying um, this is my best theory based off of the information that I have and that I've seen just for my life. Um, I'm sure it will be, um, looked at, you know, and people will, will say, well, that's wrong. This is right. Well, what about that? Please scrutinize. I make, I made a video. I say, this is my opinion. And I would love a second opinion. I would love a third opinion. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, it, is there's simple things we can do is I'm a simple person. There's simple things I can do. And I've been working on, you know, remove the, the political delusion, remove the religious delusions, remove the, your cultural delusions. If you remove all of that, then you're going to have more of a, you're going to have a more actually enjoyable time, you know, getting into this, you know, uh, this whole genre, this whole subject matter, and it's going to be easier to absorb. And you'll be yeah. able to realize your potential. As yeah. Lou mentioned right. a few right. interviews. And I think Lou is helping people do that. And I appreciate Oh that. gosh, I, I, yeah. I can't take credit for that guys. I, I, that. <laughs> I didn't say you guys are doing a, you you guys are doing a hell of a lot <laughs> more than I am in that regard. You know, I, well, I, I think I, someone I, is in your position, you know, does a, a good service though, you know, in helping, you know, having these conversations, we're grown men having a nice conversation, Phil, uh, you know, about philosophy and science and we're not arguing. We're not, you know, we're having a good time. That's, that's well, the that's way based you on to live together. You know? I agree. And that's based on a, a fundamental respect that we all have for each other. Right. And, yes. and respect is something that, you know, yes. you give, but it also has to be earned to some degree. And there are, you know, unfortunately there are individuals that, that, you know, don't um, probably, I, I don't want to say don't deserve the respect, but they have ulterior motives and, and they're not, they're not interested in real honest conversation. Uh, they're interested in, in, in driving a narrative. And for me, that's, that's problematic. I, I, I don't think we're there yet where we, we have a, a, a conclusive narrative. I think we all need to continue asking the questions that you are asking. Mm -hmm. I think your audience, you know, should continue to be, be courageous and, and ask the hard questions. You know, um, I, I don't think the truth has anything to fear. I think it's, I think it's liberating. I think, you know, the old saying, the truth sh shall set you free. I believe that. And I think mm -hmm. to me, it's, it's, you know, we're living, I think we're living in fascinating times. With that said, Jen, I, Jets, I hate to be the very bad news, but um, I'm, I'm being told that I'm, I'm running up against my my time limit here. Yeah, I appreciate you. You always give us a little extra time, and I appreciate it. And um, I'd love to do this. When's your, you com when your book coming out? Uh, I'm working on it. It's uh, uh, it's it's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot more, yeah. <laughs> a lot of work. Uh, okay. Than, well, uh, what, yeah, it is, but it's it's coming out. I want to be emailing your lovely wife, and hopefully, I can get a we can get a signed copy to give away. Sometime. Absolutely. You know, for me, right. I, I, people know I've I've got a few patents, and I thought those were hard enough, and now I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm like, wow, you know, yeah. oh my goodness. But uh, gents, it's it's been great. I really appreciate uh, being here with you guys. It's truly an honor and privilege. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Love to do this again whenever you guys 
want to. Um, you know, this was a, a really neat chat. Thank you for for indulging me. <laughs> one second, please. Could you uh, sure. maybe pass my information to Avi? I, I would love to hear feedback from Avi Lowe yeah. on uh, this book that I wrote. Yeah. In fact, why don't you, uh, if I like say um, afterwards, get with Tony, uh, shoot me an email, and what I'll do is I can put you guys in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you. You got it, guys. And again, thanks, thank Lou. you so much for everything, thank guys. You, Lou, you got thank it. you, Lou, for everything you do, man. Really, thanks. Yeah, for we appreciate it. Thank oh, man, you for what it. you guys do. My honor Can't and privilege, and a big thank you to to your uh, to your audience because at the end of the day, they're the ones that that's really making it happen. So my hats off to to all of you and and your audience. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lou. We'll be in touch. All right, guys. Take right. care and stay safe. You too. See you. Well, that was good. Ooh. Interdimensional telescope. <laughs> we had all these people in the comments. That was awesome. Throw a throw a hardball question. Throw a hardball. You know. Anyway, I, there's there's so many opinions out there. How can you that, how can you satisfy all of them? I thought of uh, it was interesting you brought that up. I've always thought of this. I don't know, for many years is uh, if you take nothing and you split it, what do you get? Two yeah, times I, I thought of that the whole time uh, he was talking about anti matter. Uh, you get two times nothing. <laughs> you get two nothings. Total exactly. destruction. Yeah, I mean it doesn't make sense, but I mean, does any of this stuff make sense? I mean, let's be honest. You know? I, you know, the people in the audience don't realize how hard it is to get. And I told you know what's funny. I'll tell people this: we had this whole structure set up. We met before. <laughs> we were, we were going to have. We were. I was going to have fifteen minutes and. Chris and Alex, they were going to have 30 minutes each. And, I, you know, we were going to close it out. hours on this question list and <laughs> burning, burning it. And, and, I, and I told, I was like, well, you're going to have to, I even told Alexa, you're going to have to learn how to, or was it you, Chris? You'll have to learn how to interject because Lou is a pro at discussion. I was talking a lot. Yeah, he definitely led the conversation. That was awesome. Yeah, and I, I found it. And that's why I found myself accidentally interrupting him last time because I was trying to force the list of questions I had. And this time I was like, okay, I'm not going to force anything. I'm just going to go with the flow. Yeah, and, no, I, I thought it was going to be, you're going to talk for 15 minutes, right? Then Chris is going to talk and then I'm going to, but no, that, <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> What's funny is I had to just start. Right. <laughs> yeah, you just started. And yeah, I was like, man, fun. I love this conversation you and you and here having about the F-16. And I thought that is huge. That is great content we're missing. You know, so oh, and we, we snagged some of that content. So yeah. I don't know if there's I don't know if you all want to try to answer any of these questions. Uh, I mean, they, I mean, they wanted me to ask him about whether, you know, uh, we thought or he thought that. Uh, UAPs were manned or unmanned. I mean, there's all these different. It's just very difficult. My impression is he doesn't have a have a really good idea. I mean, that was my impression. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. When he says we're at the South Pole and every every direction is up, I was like, okay, yeah, I no idea. Effectively, I mean, yeah. I would say half are manned and half are unmanned, right? Look, look just look at uh, human vehicles. Half are manned, half are unmanned. Yeah, I'm still at the point where I think it could be both, uh, you know, our some of our technology mixed with, you know, you know, off world technology. I think there's definitely I think we definitely have off world. Not, when I say off world, I mean, our perception. I, I have a feeling they've been here for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you know? to bring up John Searle, but that never came up. Yeah, either. Uh, yeah, I was going to cut in, but he was giving some awesome. You know, yeah, it was, we were good where we were going. So, yeah, I was going to bring up John Searle. Um, yeah. And then there was one other point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, one other thing <clears throat> while we're just talking is, um, you know, what I learned is the, the, your, your analogy, Alexei, when you talk about, um, you know, you start as a cell, you just have feel, right? So your, your perception of the universe, is just that. And then it goes out bigger, right? Until you get to your eyes, right? And then sight is the first, it's the first sense that comes from off world, essentially. Yeah, right? it, That's where you realize. Sun. Right. Yep. So now you can see off in into uh, uh, space dimensions. Um, what's interesting is that I learned that eyes, actually, your optic nerve um, is the only cranial nerve, right? It's a cranial nerve that goes out of your cranium. So your, your, I guess your optical nerve is part of your brain system, actually. If you think about that, you know, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. Yeah, so the optics grew out of a pre-existing brain almost is what you're getting at. It's, it seems it's, it's so 
important for the brain that it comes out of it. Does that make sense? It's, uh, yeah, no, what's funny yeah. about our eyes is that um, our brains actually create. That's for a neurosurgeon. You yeah. know, that's like a different field that needs. To, sorry, I didn't want to cut you. Like, that's like a different field needs to get involved. You know, I'm, I'm, well, our, our, our eyes are like the lens of a camera. They're not producing the image. They're just taking the light in. Right. They perceive it. So, so how we dream when we dream and we see images. Our brain is creating just like they are when we're opening our, opening our eyes, right? Well, that's what it, they call it's it. getting like a, a different USB jack. Like there's another. <laughs> that's right. Like, <laughs> the input it's, blue, it's Bluetooth. So well, even when you like, close uh, your eyes and see something, input. right? You're getting. Yeah. I, right now, I close my eyes. I can still imagine uh, Tony's face. I mean, Chris's face. I actually, that's how I started off trying to meditate long many years ago was paying attention, you know, when you close your eyes, you tend to blind yourself, right? What, what I was practiced doing was keeping a, a, an awareness of what my eyes saw and it helped me focus. So I've done lots of different yeah. practices during meditation and one of them was called blind days. So you have a blind day. And then um, I took my soccer team out one time and uh, I was coach, right? So we had blind soccer practice and we had to get in a triangle and pass the ball to the person in front of you with your eyes closed, but you have to say their name then they say their name. So you, you echolocate and then you kick the ball. But what you notice is you'll hear the grass. You'll hear the ball going through the grass. And even after one hour of practicing that, your next soccer game, you will hear the ball rolling in the grass towards you. So I just found that like super fascinating with my with my team. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just wonder if there's a next, you know, what's the next sense? You know, is that what we're coming up against? Potentiality, love, no love. That's where I'm at, but I don't know, you know, like what's the next sense? Uh, you know, well, it seems like telepathy, right? I mean, it seems like tele all of right. the, all the cases is telepathic pretty much. Right. Yep. There's no sonic booms. Those, those two points are kind of interesting to me. And so is telepathy quicker than light? It must be right. That's the next question I think science should ask, because if you could do telepathic experiments and then prove that it's quicker than the speed of light, you, you could say now that that's your quantum sense um, because, yeah. you know, the, the entanglement, that'd be like It'd your be, sense of entanglement. It's, it's like radio, radio frequencies are at the speed of light, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So it might be that, that maybe not light's not the universal speed limit, but it could maybe our, our thoughts operate. Well, on the and same that's speed. what I'm, it could be the speed limit. If you're talking about our dimensional level, you know, if you're talking about our universe, right. But if, if this isn't the real universe universe, right? This is just a simulation or a, a model of it, if you will, like a, like a football game, right? Then you could quantum entangle. I, I think Hal Puthoff, I think he's working on that. I, I heard that he's working on quantum communication. And that's what I think quantum communication would be, is that instantaneous. Yeah. You know, I, I make a T appear over here and a T appears on your screen, you know? Yeah, faster than light. Exactly. So that would be like telepathic, right? So maybe it's just uh, telepathy is some way to interact quantum. I don't know. That's interesting, though, because, you uh, you know, one, one thing that never occurred to me was that uh, that's the reason Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, right? Because of the distances that you could make that change. But what is the typical speed. In other words, there is a speed, right? What is the speed of that uh, reaction? There's no speed. As far as it's they understand, instant. it happens at the yes. same time. <laughs> That's what they know. Or think. Quantum entanglement. Yeah. You can look up a uh, quantum entanglement, Tony. It blows your mind. I, I no, just, I, no, I've studied yeah. it. I'm saying that wow. you would, I'm just, I'm, it's a thought experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that goes faster than if light. light if light has a speed, 386,000 miles per so, second or whatever, yeah. that, would you might, that, you, that, that, that action may have a speed. I'm not saying it has a limit. I'm saying, there, you know, I'm saying maybe that's the new theory. Maybe that spooky action is the new speed limit instead of light. I don't know. Well, if it's traveling within a fifth dimension, our, our, our experience is being manifested from a fourth, the speed of quantum entanglement would be more related to that fifth dimensional vortex. And so from our perception, the speed of quantum entanglement is always the same. But in the dimension of density, um, it would have some type of speed. That's what I'm saying. We, we can't if we can't because we can't perceive, perceive its speed. We're saying it doesn't have a speed, but it probably right. it would be perceivable from the dimension of density. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's and why I said if you were to map gyroscopes, you could you could figure out a lot of information. And you hear about these ships appearing, right? Like a large triangle giant craft ship. Um, Alexei, is there some reason to you? Would it help to move across dimensions um, by going into like a smaller, large, probably larger dimension, right? So let's say I want to go to Sagittarius B or whatever. Um, I, if I decrease my size down to Ant Man, right? I'm just going to stay in in this on this planet essentially, right? In a way. But if I can somehow change my whatever size to go super giant well so think about orbits yeah. right and you think yeah. about um velocity and you think about the rotations and arc lengths so like if the smaller you are the quicker you're going to orbit around the center of time yeah. and so if you shrink down you get spun halfway across the universe then you shrink up or you stand out um now you've literally gone halfway around the universe because you've traveled within an inner realm um so if you're, you're saying go inner, can you go inner realm and then back out? Could I yeah. pop in? Could I go inner realm and then pop out on the other side of the universe? Yeah. So that's why I say like that would be if they were coming from other planets. Yeah, they could have evolved like planets, not all interdimensional. But if they were traveling from other planets, they would be going through the dimension of density in order to go faster than light. In order to go faster than light, they have to go. They have to go inward, let the universe naturally carry them around and then go outward. Let me uh, let me thank people. People are complaining because I'm not. You get that right? What I'm saying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, so they can, I'm going to end the I'm going to end the broadcast and we can continue to talk. They're they're like I'm going to go watch it back. From the, can't watch it from the beginning again. Until oh okay. It. So thanks yeah, I guys. Go eat dinner. Yeah, yeah I, I, pre I appreciate y'all coming. I guess we'll just. End it. We'll I want to show you my video game, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave because somebody's coming to look at our house. It's the so. multiverse game for sandbox. <clears throat> All right, sweet. Yeah, we'll awesome. I'll show you later or whatever. But yeah. yeah, I don't know, Tony. We've been working a lot. Um, we got an <laughs> NFT program. We're building a company to build uh, sandbox games. Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll see. I know. Alexei tells me a little bit about it uh, as as you're going along. So I think it's cool. Did you finish your cabin out in the woods? I'm <laughs> almost there. I'm almost there. I'm about ready to move in. But they reminded me of you know when Lou was talking about that uh, out in space. You know, if Tony's alone out inside, I was thinking of you up in your cabin. That's the Tony's whole idea. alone up in his cabin. Is when you get my age, you want to move out into the space by yourself. I have to do my plug real quick. Um, so, I, you know, a theoretical physicist, but I, I do all kinds of random jobs. All right. I would love to have this be my full focus. And so, guys, if, you know, you can find my book at LuciusLabs.com. And uh, it, it's a, it'll walk you step by step from modern accepted physics to a new view of reality. It's the easiest way to put it. Yeah, I had all these plans. I was going to give away a Lou's book. I was going to uh, give away one of your books and just give it away. You just, I mean, you anybody know. who's here right now should get a free book. I mean, can you still do it? <laughs> I could give um, Chris is going to pay for it. <laughs> I'll pay for it. How did? How are you going to do it? I'm uh, just kidding. I was going to buy two books, one of Chris's and one of Lou's. And I mean, one of Alexei's and one of Lou's. And I was going to give them away, but then we ran out of time and. Uh, what Next I'm going to do, I'm going to get one of Lou's books, and I'm going to have another video. I'm going to have another. I'm going to have a giveaway, but I, I realized I didn't have time to do it, and he had to leave. So I'm going to do it, though. I promise. Yeah, uh, Artisan, thank you again. Um, you know, for inviting me to be on today's show. Oh, you got. I can't. You know, I couldn't do this without you guys because yep. you all are the brains. I'm just uh, somehow lucky enough to be. Yeah, ride, ride yeah. in the back of the truck. Are you yeah. in? Are, the, like, are you on the space do... balloon, Tony? Are you going to help on the space balloon? I want to. Yeah, okay. yeah, I want to. All right, cool. All right, we'll we'll talk to you guys. Okay. All right, buddy. All right, All right. see you. See you. Ciao.